Hey guys, welcome back. We are going to be going over capnography today. Capnography for the EMS provider mainly. How to use capnography in the field, valid for paramedics, uh, pre-hospital. We're not going to go too much into the uh, in-depth stuff that, that anesthesiologists would use and, and how the hospitals would use it. If you want to go a uh, deep dive into that, I'd recommend going to capnography.com. That's a very good website <clears throat> for learning everything capnography. But we're pretty much going to be covering what you need to know, the down and dirty, and here are our objectives. Define capnography. We're going to be comparing some uh, capnography to other monitoring uh, parameters that we're going to be talking about. Describing some of the physiology behind it. We're going to be going over a normal capnogram some abnormal waveforms, and why we would use it in EMS. Well, as far as terminology goes, capnography comes from the word capnose, meaning smoke. We use our CO2 monitoring as a non-invasive way to measure the amount of exhaled CO2 at the end of the breath, at the end of the tidal volume breath. So we call it ETCO2, standing for end tidal CO2. Now, the magic number that you guys want to remember is 35 to 45. That is the magic ventilation respiratory number anything over 45 you would be considered in a state of respiratory acidosis if you just think of co2 as acid the more co2 i have then the more acidic my respiratory system is the less i have if it's below 35 then i would say i would have you know less co2 in my respiratory system so i'd be alkalotic so i'd be in a state of respiratory acidosis some more terminology for you. Well, we've been using the color metric um, kind of CO2 detectors for a while. And we've all seen those before. They're disposable. They have litmus paper. And when, they're, when you're bagging somebody, you got an ET tube and you're bagging them, they're going to present with different colors at around the eighth breath. They take about eight breaths to kind of register. We have yellow, purple, and gray. And if you just always remember yellow, yes, purple, poor, gray, good. Uh, they'll kind of get you by, but we always want to be in the yellow when we're talking about that. But, you know, we have a little bit more in uh, invasive ways. I wouldn't even say invasive. We have better ways to monitor our end tidal CO2 now, and that's our capnogram. Now, as far as terminology goes, our capnogram is our graphical tracing, a representation of exhaled CO2 at the airway. It's the actual waveform that gets presented. It's that little waveform, and we see it all the time. This is the box. That little boxy-like waveform that you want to see <clears throat> is your capnogram. And there's a, little, there's a little life pack there where we would use it. And we also have our capnograph. Our capnograph is an instrument. It's a monitor that provides the number and a waveform, as opposed to a capnogram. You might want to remember that for a test. Capnography is the actual ventilation process and it's measured with capnography all right so there's two things to kind of get down we talk about oxygenation versus ventilation oxygenation is the process of getting the o2 into the body and tissues to the target organs and we use our sao2 to monitor that we use the saturation of arterial oxygen our sao2 to, mon to monitor our oxygenation you can't measure oxygenation with and tidal CO2, we measure ventilation. And that's the process of actually eliminating the CO2 from the body. Remember, CO2 is the waste product of cellular metabolism. So if I'm metabolizing well, if I have glucose entering into my mitochondria, remember that from, from physiology, if I have CO2 being produced, my Krebs cycle is working. And therefore, everything is all well and good. Here's little physiology of CO2 here we have oxygen you know we breathe in the oxygen it fills up our lungs that oxygen is going to get diffused into my alveoli into my blood it's going to go to my muscles and tissues for oxygenation it's going to be uptake into my mitochondria for metabolism it's going to expel a couple things one of the things is CO2 it's going to go back into my bloodstream back to my lungs and I'm going to breathe it out <clears throat> We talk about that gradient difference. Remember, the air I breathe in <clears throat> has less CO2 than the air than the blood that's coming back to my lungs, so I'm going to have diffusion happening. Just like the air I breathe in has more oxygen than the 
blood coming in uh, back to my lungs. So oxygen and CO2 are going to uh, change places due to that gradient difference in oxygen and CO2. All right. But this capnography can provide information about perfusion, and that's what we really care about. Um, if you have the opportunity to use CO2 in the field, you would notice that if you're doing CPR in a patient, they have low CO2 values. Um, it's not so rare that you're working a, you're working a cardiac arrest and they have a CO2 of about 5 or 8. That all of a sudden, the heart starts beating, they, got, they start getting cardiac output, good cardiac output. And that CO2 gets all of a sudden, bam, rises up to 35, 40. If you see that during CPR, then you got to be asking yourselves, hey, there's no way that my manual CPR is going to cause that much metabolism. It's not going to cause that much perfusion, allowing my CO2 to be driven to 35, 40. Maybe I have the help of a beating heart. So we can use it. We can use low values. And when we see low values, we always got to think that there's a decrease in cardiac output. Maybe it's a cardiogenic shock. The ETCO2 will be reduced. All right. So let's look at the normal capnogram. Now here's a normal capnogram. It's got basic components of it, just like an EKG. It's got our isoelectric line, if you will, just like our EKGs do. This is our zero baseline. And we say that's from A to B. Then we have this rapid respiratory upstroke and that's from B to C now remember this is corresponding to my respirations all right this is corresponding to my ventilation so what you're gonna see with this rise here you have a co2 that's rising so your respiratory upstroke is when my patient is breathing out all right so patient breathes out creates this rapid upstroke and they continue to breathe out creating this plateau phase. This is the alveolar plateau phase from C to D. This little dot up here at, at uh, part D here on the waveform, this is my end tidal CO2 number. This is what the monitor reads as my end tidal CO2. And if I were to draw a line straight across <clears throat> like that, all right, this is my line here, that is what the capnogram would be reading as a number. So this is reading of about 38. This is a graph here. Vor uh, vertical up here is the actual CO2. Left to right on your CO2 actually represents time, just like an EKG does. So right here at phase D is what your ETCO2, your capnogram monitor, is actually reading. Your end tidal CO2 at the end of my exhalation. Then I have a rapid downstroke, and this is my inspiration. As my patient breathes in, or I bag my patient, I'm washing out that side stream sampler. I'm washing out that CO2 uh, sampler. I'm washing it out of all of its CO2, and I'm dropping that back down to baseline. And this is that box we see. So we have isoelectric, or we have zero baseline, where there's nothing going on. Exhalation, CO2 is rising, rising, plateau, inhalation. Exhalation, plateau, inhalation and it does it over and over again all right pretty cool stuff so at the beginning of our exhalation there's no co2 in the breath at the beginning why because we have dead air space you got to keep that in mind about 150 mls of dead air space middle of our exhalation we have this rapid rise in co2 it's all starting to flush out but at the end of it we start seeing it gradually rise, and that is our alveolar plateau phase. I always kind of related it to a bunch of people leaving a movie theater at the end of the movie. At the end of the movie, you have this rush of people going to the door. But then as that initial rush of people exit, then I'm going to have a slow, steady exiting of people until I have no people left. And that would be my end title CO2. I don't know why that made sense to me, but... Hey, you're going through school. You got to you gotta do what works, right? <clears throat> so the CO2 levels will gradually rise and peak just before the inspiration. That is my ETCO2. Think about it. When you take a deep breath in, when you take a breath in, you breathe in, you know, you take a, a rapid breath in initially, and then you kind of slow down, and that causes that plateau. So we have this zero baseline here. My patient exhales and inhalation. 
All right, that is my normal CO2 waveform. So we've all said this before. I knew I know the tube was in, but we moved to the gurney. Patient moved uh, from the ambulance. We moved to the ER. We had CPR progress. Patient had a seizure. They were agitated. All right. ETCO2 has now become the gold standard. It's required for all intubated patients and copy tube patients. We can prove that that tube, that plastic, was between cords by having that ETCO2 waveform printed out. And this is what we want. We have a nice CO2 waveform as my patient is exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling. But we got a problem at the end of that. And we'll let it run through again. All right, we're going to be going over this waveform, but it's decreasing. My CO2 value is decreasing all the way down to zero. What would you suspect, uh, suspect causes that? Well, this is a displaced endotracheal tube, all right, which is awesome that we can see that because if we're bagging somebody 100% O2 for 15 minutes, and their FiO2 is, we got a 100%, a 1 of FiO2, and they got a PO2 uh, value now on their ABGs of 500. They're not going to show signs of hypoxia for the next couple minutes. But if we have our patient hooked up to our CO2 monitor, then I can tell literally breath to breath if that tube gets dislodged or not, and I can correct it before my patient starts decompensating, which is huge, huge for us. This thing is huge in a helicopter too when you when you can't take vital signs. I'm sorry, when you can't take lung sounds. Um, if you're in like a, a situation where you can't listen for lung sounds or it's too loud, you can rely solely on your ETCO2 to tell whether or not that tube is in the trachea or not. All right, but this ETCO2 will respond much faster when the tube actually gets displaced. All right. <clears throat> Remember, ETCO2 is a monitor of ventilation, and that's what we want. SpO2 is our oxygenation, and if we have bagging our, if we're bagging our patient at, you know, 100% O2 for the last 15 minutes, and their PO2 is through the roof, it's going to be a while before they actually start showing signs of deoxygenation. All right. Well, we can also use our ETCO2 for our non-intubated patients. And the big the big guy here that we use as paramedics and EMS is the bronco, bronchospasm. We can tell if somebody is bronchoconstricted based on an ETCO2 waveform. We'll go over that. You can tell whether or not your patient is starting to hypoventilate. <clears throat> we can tell shock states. All right. We can tell a whole bunch of stuff. And there's a little chart here talking about hyperventilating. Now... When my patient hyperventilates, remember, the faster I breathe, the more CO2 I'm going to breathe out. So respiratory alkalosis is most likely due to hyperventilation as opposed to respiratory alkalosis where I have, I'm sorry, respiratory acidosis where I have high CO2 levels is mainly due to a patient hypoventilating. They're tiring out. As my patient starts breathing less, my CO2 is going to raise and I can see that on my monitor and I can make corrections towards it now don't get confused breath stacking short choppy breaths that are breath stacking will cause my co2 to rise hyperventilation deep tachypnic breaths will cause my patient hyperpnic patients will cause my co2 to lower all right so looking at my bronchospasm uh, CO2 waveform, um, when I look at it, <clears throat> I have this classic shark tooth pattern or the shark fin pattern. If you see the shark fin pattern, your patient most likely has some type of bronchospasm condition. Classic test question. You're looking for this shark fin pattern, this slurring of your alveolar plateau phase. Now, if you just think about it common sense wise... <clears throat> Yeah, I normally have this inspiratory, or I'm sorry, this expiratory upstroke. My patient's breathing out, generating CO2. But at right in mid exhalation here, if it's hard for that CO2 to exhale, then this is going to be a lot more slanted. And that is the indicator that my patient's actually having some type of bronchoconstriction or bronchospasm. And we could tell that on a CO2, it's great. All right. Well, when we think about hypoventilation syndromes, we think about anything that can cause hypoventilation. We think about our ETOH 
overdoses, our patients with drug overdoses, seizure patients that are postictal, head trauma, neuromuscular disease or neuromuscular blockers when they start kicking in will all cause hypoventilation and we can tell that. <clears throat> when we're looking at patients in shock, whether or not it be cardiogenic, septic, hemorrhagic, hypovolemic, we're going to see a downward drop or we're going to see a trending in that CO2 actually starting to lower from the baseline that it was. So if my patient had a CO2 or an end tidal CO2 of 40, and then all of a sudden starts decreasing to 38, 35, 30, 25, then my patient's cardiac output is starting to drop. And we can see that here. This is initial, pre I mean, uh, pretend that this is a long um, capnograph and we have you know more than one box like this. <clears throat> But here's my baseline here, and it's slowly starting to go down. It's trending downward. All right, that would be a loss of cardiac output. Who knows? Probably from a PE or from shock or from cardiac output. However, your patient is presenting, you can make a pretty good diagnosis that your patient's cardiac output is starting to decrease. All right, so your CO2 is lowering with smaller waveforms. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Well, let's look at this one. Well, when you see two graphs like this, this is a real-time graph, all right? This prints out um, the same speed as an EKG does. This is going to print out a little quicker, all right? This is going to print out a little quicker, and this is looking at trends. This is looking breath to breath. This is looking at trends, so 25 millimeters a second, and this is trends. All right, so we're going to look breath to breath. Well, what's going on here? What is going on? Well, this is my CO2 of 40. I have a little bit lower of a CO2. If I see that, yeah, I can ask myself, what should I do with my bagging if my CO2 is low? Well, if you have low CO2, then what you should do with your bagging is slow it down because that's going to build up your CO2. So we can use our CO2 to guide our respirations. Well, what do we got here? Here's our CO2 of 40. It looks like we have a little bit high of a CO2. Well, what can we do with this? If, I, if I'm bagging my patient, I have a higher CO2. Well, I can bag a little quicker. All right. Use your CO2 to guide your ventilation rate. Well, what's wrong with this waveform? Right. It's got that slurring plateau phase. This patient is bronchoconstricted. This is probably an asthmatic patient or something's going on with bronchoconstriction. <clears throat> Rut row. What's wrong with this one? Well, we have a long or a plateau phase here. So this patient is probably hypoventilated. But right here, it drops down almost flatline. We can kind of relate this to V-fib, right? On an EKG. On V-fib, the heart's dying or dead <clears throat> or in the process of dying. Here, the respiratory system is dying. Either that or your tube has just become dislodged. One of the two. We do not want to see that on our CO2. <clears throat> well, how about this? We got a lower CO2, and it's slowly raising. All right? Here's breath to breath. Here's my trend. This is what I'm looking at, my trends here. Well, if I see this, for some reason, my cardiac output is improving. Maybe in your non-intubated patient, whatever treatment you're rendering is working and cardiac output is actually getting better. Well, if you were bagging your patient and you saw this breath to breath or you saw this as your trend trending downward, my CO2 is starting to drop. Is your bagging okay? I would say not. All right. I would say not. You're dropping their CO2. You want to keep it level. So use your waveforms as a guide in your bagging. All right. Well, here's a little picture of a life pack 12. We got our CO2 line hooked into our CO2 port. It's the little orange, uh, orange line there. Here's a little pad of a life pack 12. And here's the capno, um, the capnogram number. All right, the capnography number that we're going to get, 31. A little low, and it also gives us our respiratory rate. Here is a end tidal CO2, the filter line for it that goes on the end of ET tubes. Here is the 
nasal cannula CO2 that we can do on non-intubated patients. There's a picture of it. <clears throat> so what we just talked about, what capnography, uh, what you can monitor for. We confirm tube placement using our capnography, print it out, bring it to the ER with you. We can identify ROSC during CPR. And actually some people are using CO2 to call codes in the field that aid you. After 10 minutes of working in an asystolic patient, if your CO2 is less than 10, you can pretty much bet the farm that they're not coming back. So we, not only can we use CO2 as guiding our CPR with effective compressions, if we have a higher CO2 during compressions, then we're moving a lot of blood and we're doing good perfusion. But we can also use it as the inevitably dead patient. Non-intubated patients, we can look for uh, progression of acute respiratory failure. Sedated patients, and we're going to go over a couple of those waveforms as well. So here's a couple of these comparing side by side. Here's my normal box-like uh, CO2 capnogram waveform. Um, part D, this, resp this plateau phase here, is reading at 45. That's normal. Well, here's a hyperventilating patient. We have a faster rate, and we have a lower CO2 right here at the end tidal. Right? The faster I breathe, CO2 is going to go down. My hypoventilating patient is going to have a longer plateau phase and a higher CO2. My bronchospastic patient is going to have this shark fin type waveform that's slurring at the plateau phase. So here's all of them kind of compared. Quiz time. What's going on with your patient? Uh-oh. This is what we do not want to see. What would you think of when you, if you see this on your 12 lead or your, uh, your life pack? Not good. My patient's apneic now, right? What could cause it? Airway obstruction. Something is blocking that ET tube so that CO2 cannot get out. Or it's a dislodged tube. Not good. Or the bag has been disconnected from my tube or from the wall. Or the ventilator's malfunctioning. This is... Uh, very common and cardiac arrest my patient is all of a sudden not producing any co2 they're not perfusing so I lost I lose my waveform this is a sudden loss of waveform <coughs> use your dope mnemonic when you're when you have a patient who's decompensating on the vent the very first thing you should do is remove the ventilator from that ET tube and bag your patient and see if that makes it any better but if you see this, you have to consider, did my tube get dislodged or did my patient just die? Okay. Well, let's look at what's going on here. My boxes are slowly getting taller. My CO2 is rising. When I look at my trend, it's trending upward. Causes. Decrease in respiratory rate. My patient is starting to hypoventilate, building up that CO2 as it's becoming trapped because we're not blowing it out effectively. I have decreases in tidal volumes. I might have to increase my tidal volume on my patient. <clears throat> or my patient's metabolic rate is getting higher and they're starting to produce more CO2, right? Or my patient's becoming hyperthermic. A rise in body temperature will cause a rise in CO2. They go hand in hand. So this is an increase in ETCO2. Well, I intubate my patient and I see this. I never see a nice box-like waveform. I see these rounded, almost sinusoidal waves. And I have a really bad trend right after I intubate my patient, right? Well, a normal capnogram is the best evidence that the ET tube is, cor is uh, correctly positioned. So if you don't see that, then I probably have an esophageal intubation. Check your tube with this. This is an esophageal intubated waveform. We do not want to see that. We need our first pass success, especially on our sick, shocky patients. Well, let's look at this one. This has got an upside down trend. If you notice here, it's trending upward at the baseline, but this is a rising baseline. Well, what could cause that? Well, if I know that this right, this part right here is my respiratory upstrokes when I'm exhaling CO2 out exhaling exhaling inspiration I never go back down to baseline so the patient is starting a breath 
again before it reaches baseline. So they're starting to breathe before they fully inhale. All right, they're starting to exhale before they fully inhale. Well, what could cause that? Well, a faulty expiratory valve can cause that, inadequate inspiratory flow, or if my patient's intubated, they might actually be starting to breathe on their own. They're starting to trigger a breath before they're actually adequately inhaling. All right. They call this rebreathing, rebreathing the vent. If you see your patient rebreathing the vent, they might need to be sedated a little more um, to put them back on that assist control or else they're going to be bucking that vent and it's going to be really uncomfortable. <clears throat> well, let's look at this. What's going on here? We have a nice <clears throat> box-like waveform here, but then I have a nice respiratory upstroke. My patient is exhaling, breathing out that CO2, but then I have a shortened plateau phase and a slurring downward. All right. This is kind of like a backwards shark fin. And if I look at my trends, this is my trend. It starts off high and then it drops suddenly and it goes low and it's, and it's regular after that. Well, this is classic for a leaky or deflated endotracheal cuff. If I see that, you might want to consider checking the pilot balloon on my ET tube and seeing if I need to put more air in it. All right. Or the two, the, uh, the tube might be too small for the patient. This is inadequate seal, inadequate seal, CO2 waveform. Well, here we got a nice regular waveform and then it's slowly starting to drop. And I have that classic downward trend. We should know what this is by now. <clears throat> This is hyperventilation. They are blowing off that CO2. All right. It could be an increase in respiratory rate, but we're also looking at the number of boxes to calculate our respiratory rate or think about our respiratory rate. But this is slowly blowing off the CO2. Or I can have an increase in tidal volume. If I have a, a bagging where the, the, the new medic, the rookie medic is bagging our patient, they're excited about intubating their patient and they're not paying attention to how much tidal volume they're giving them. If they're slamming uh, volume, large amounts of volume into this patient's lungs, it's going to blow off a lot of that CO2 and it's going to cause a downward trend. All right? Or my patient could be dying. They're a shocky patient and the CO2 is starting to go down. All right? That could be a, a bad thing. And just like hyperthermia caused a rise in CO2, a fall in body temperature, hypothermia, will cause a decrease in CO2. All right, so it's a decrease in our ETCO2. Well, we know what this one is, right? What does this wave look like? This looks like our classic slurring of our plateau phase, right? This is either due to a kinked ET tube or bronchospasm, all right? Classic, classic obstruction pattern. Well, here's one that's pretty cool. Our patient exhales, generating CO2, causing a plateau phase. But then I have a sharp decrease right here, this dip. If you see this dip on your ventilated patients or uh, your patients that are on a ventilator, then you have to ask yourself, are the muscle relaxants beginning to subside? Because now my patient is starting to rebreathe. They're starting to generate their own breath. It's not going to be a strong breath but they're coming out of their sedation and they're starting to breathe on the monitor or they're starting to breathe on their own. This patient might need to be sedated some more. All right. This is a cleft. This cleft is inversely proportional to the degree of drug activity, inversely proportional. So the deeper this wave is, the more my patient is coming out. And that is called a career cleft. Pretty cool stuff, huh? All right, guys, what I have here is a LifePak 12, <clears throat> um, and I have an ETCO2 hooked up to it right there, a little orange thing right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some respiratory patterns so you can see in the real-life application on, on why, we, why we would use this. <clears throat> so let me silence that alarm real quick. <clears throat> All right, you notice we have our capnography right there with our CO2 number and our capnogram. 
right there showing our line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to breathe in this like a normal person would breathe in and out. So imagine our patient is intubated um, and we have our CO2 hooked up. As you can see, we have our box-like picture here with our CO2 at 35. That's normal. That's what we want to see. Now let's see what our CO2 would look like when a patient hyperventilating. And you're going to see this 35 number here drop a little bit because we know that hyperventilation blows off more CO2 and they're going to be more in a state of respiratory alkalosis. So let's see what happens. <clears throat> You see how it's faster, smaller, the boxes aren't as wide, and our CO2 drops. So that's directly corresponding to respiratory rate at a rate of 101. That's that's a little uh, that's a little high. So we're going to tell our patients to slow down. Or with our patient that we're ventilating, we are going to bag slower. Okay. So let's see what happens when we bag slower. Our CO2 raises, goes back to baseline. Pretty cool stuff, huh?